So let's now look at the questions which we might be asked in this section. So the first question is asking, in extraction of sulfur by frust process, water is pumped into the sulfur deposit. Then the first question letter A is asking, state the role of water. So what is the role of water in frust process? So the role of superheated water, that is 170 degrees Celsius at 10 atmosphere. So the role of water, it is used to melt the sulfur. That is the function of the, of the superheated water, to melt the sulfur. So the second question, if we can be, uh, be able to ask, uh, that is section B, we can be able to ask, what is the function of the high pressure uh, in the outermost pipe? Yeah, what's the function of the high pressure in the outermost pipe? So we'll say that the function of the high pressure is to maintain water to, or the function of the high pressure is to maintain water to be in liquid form. So remember water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Now water is at 170 degrees Celsius. So the function of the high pressure is just to maintain the water in liquid form so that it forces all these molecules of water to come together in order to form a liquid and not a gas. So the function of the high, of the high pressure is to maintain water to be in liquid form. So the next question is asking, Explain how the temperatures of 170 degrees Celsius is achieved and maintained. So explain how temperatures of 170 degrees Celsius is achieved and maintained. So that is simple. So the water is seated under very high pressure of 10 to 15 atmosphere. So if it's seated at very high pressure of 10 to 15 atmosphere, so this high temperature will be maintained between the different molecules of water. And that is the answer. So the answer lies between the very high pressure that, uh, that water is, is in. So that very high pressure maintains that temperature. So the next one, let's look at question number two. So question number two is asking, which allotrope of sulfur is stable at room temperature? So which allotrope of sulfur is stable at room temperature? So remember, we look at two different types of crystalline allotropes. So the first one we looked at was the rhombic sulfur, then the next one was the monoclinic sulfur. So for the rhombic sulfur, remember we say that it is stable below 96 degrees Celsius. For the monoclinic sulfur, remember we say that it is stable above 96 degrees Celsius. So the allotrope of sulfur which will be stable at room temperature will be rhombic sulfur. Why? Because room temperatures ranges between 23 to 27 degrees Celsius. Rhombic sulfur is stable below 96 degrees Celsius. So it will mean that from 96 degrees Celsius to 0 degrees Celsius, we are going to have rhombic sulfur. So since we are going to have rhombic sulfur, it will mean that rhombic sulfur can be able to be stable at 23 to 27 degrees Celsius. So the answer to here will be rhombic sulfur. So which allotrope of sulfur is stable at room temperature? The answer is rhombic sulfur. So the next question, which is letter B, is asking, which allotrope of sulfur has a prismatic crystalline crystal? So which allotrope of sulfur has prismatic crystalline crystal? That is monoclinic sulfur. Because remember, for the rhombic sulfur, remember we say that it has an octahedral shape. For the, for the monoclinic sulfur, we say that it has a hexagonal prism shape. And this question is asking which allotrope of sulfur has a prismatic crystal? So that automatically becomes the monoclinic sulfur. So apart from that, uh, question letter C is asking, which allotrope of sulfur has higher density than the other? So the allotrope of sulfur which has a higher density, the crystalline, we have the rhombic sulfur. The rhombic sulfur, remember, the density is 2.06 grams per centimeters cubed. For the monoclinic sulfur, remember it said that the density is 1.98 grams per centimeters cubed. So which of the allotrope of sulfur has a higher density? So we have rhombic sulfur having a density of 2.06 grams per centimeter cubed. For the monoclinic, remember, it is 1.98 grams per centimeter cubed. So apart from that, let's look at uh, question number three. So the question number three is asking, a small amount of sulfur was bound in a deflagrating spoon, as you can see. So a, a small amount of sulfur was burnt in a deflagrating spoon. So the burning sulfur was then lowered in a gas jar full of oxygen. So we had a deflagrating spoon, then we burned sulfur in a gas jar full of oxygen. So the first question is asking, write an equation for the reaction which took place. 
So the question is asking, a small amount of sulfur was burned in a deflagrating spoon. So the burning sulfur was then lowered in a gas jar full of oxygen. Write an equation for the reaction. So this is simple. Sulfur is reacting in oxygen. So sulfur plus excess oxygen, we are going to get sulfur 4 oxide, which is SO2. So apart from that question, uh, letter B is asking, the product form is then dissolved in water. State the effects of the resulting solution in a litmus paper. So if you dissolve sulfur oxide inside water, we are going to get an acidic solution. So it will mean that the blue litmus paper changes color to red, while the red litmus paper color will remain to be red. So why is it that the blue litmus paper will change color to red? It's because since the resulting solution is acidic, it is sulfurous acid to sulfuric acid. Since the resulting solution is acidic, therefore the blue litmus paper is going to detect an acidic solution and it will change color from blue to a red color. The red litmus paper will not be interfered with anyhow because the red litmus paper indicates an acidic solution. So since it will remain red, it will indicate that that is, uh, that is an acidic solution. Since blue will change to red, it will also indicate that that is an acidic solution. So if you have been given such a question in an exam, don't base your answers on only one type of litmus paper. Base your answer uh, based on the two litmus paper. So, Say, the blue litmus paper will change to this color and the red will remain that color. That is right. Avoid saying that the blue litmus paper will change color to red, then leave your answer like that. Also tell us what will happen to the other litmus paper in order for you to score the full marks of the question. So question number four is asking, study the chart below and uh, answer the question that follow. So it's a chart and then this chart, you are going to follow the chart in order to get all the answers, whereby all the answers should be. So question letter A is asking, uh, identify solid labeled A. So let's first of all interact with the chart. So for the chart, we see that we have sulfur reacting with solid A, and then we have step one, and then we have a black solid, and then we are going to have step two, as you can see. We're going to have step two, and then from step two, we have that compound, and then we have gas E, then sulfur plus water. So identify solid A. So solid A, remember, we are reacting sulfur with this solid A to get a black solid B. And then this black solid B, if we react it in step two, we are going to get ion three chloride. So since here we have ion three chloride, it will mean that sulfur is reacting with something ion in order now for us now here to get ion three chloride. Because as you can look at the chart, we have that chart. Sulfur is reacting with solid A. We don't know what is solid A. And then for that solid A, we see that we have step one. And then step one, we have black solid B. So still we don't know what that black solid B is. So for us to get now the hint by which black solid can be, so we're going to look at the next. So the next one is telling us that black solid B under step two, we are getting ion three chloride. Now this ion tells us that there is some ion in this step, so in this step we have ion somewhere. So it takes us back to whereby sulfur is reacting. So you see that sulfur is reacting with uh, solid A in order to get the black solid B. So automatically it will mean that sulfur is reacting with ion fillings because in step two we are getting ion something. So if you're getting ion something it will mean that initially then sulfur reacted with iron, a compound of iron, which we don't know. It reacted with a compound of iron so that here we now get iron 3 chloride. So automatically solid A now becomes iron fillings. So sulfur is then reacting with iron fillings in step one in order for us to get the black solid B. So the next one we are now being asked, identify the solid B. So if, I, if iron reacts with sulfur, we are going to get iron 2 sulfide. That is what, uh, that's what happens. So ion plus sulfur, we're going to get now the black solid B being ion to sulfide. So uh, let's go to the next question, which is Roman 3. It is asking, identify gas E. So where is gas E? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so identify gas E. So gas E, we see that we have ion 3 chloride plus gas E, and then we are going to get uh, sulfur plus water. So automatically gas E becomes hydrogen sulfide. So that is hydrogen sulfide, whereby if ion 3 chloride reacts with uh, hydrogen sulfide, we're going to get sulfur plus water in an exothermic reaction. 
So question letter B is asking, name the reagent used in step letter 2. So in step 2, which reagent was used in step 2? So remember here, we have um, ion 2 sulfide. So we have ion 2 sulfide. Ion 2 sulfide is reacting with something, and then the resulting uh, product is ion 3 chloride. Ion 2 chloride, rather. Ion 2 chloride. So it will mean that now we have introduced chlorine. So since now we have introduced chlorine, it will mean that the reagent in step 2 is something chloride. Because we see that ion 2 sulfide, it's a sulfide. And then we don't know uh, the reagent, but the product has a chloride. So it will mean that in step 2, we are reacting a compound having chlorine. So if ion 2 sulfide reacts with hydrochloric acid, therefore we are going to get ion 3 chloride. So yeah, so we are going to get ion 3 chloride. So automatically it will mean that in step 2, the reagent automatically becomes hydrochloric acid, whereby the hydrochloric acid is now going to donate the chlorine. And then the hydrogen that's going to remain is going to react with the sulfur from the ion 2 sulfide to form the hydrogen sulfide, which is gas letter E. So that's, that's what happened basically in this chart. So remember how it began? Sulfur reacting with iron. So if sulfur reacts with iron, we get iron 2 sulfide. So after getting iron 2 sulfide, iron 2 sulfide reacts with hydrochloric acid. So if iron 2 sulfide reacts with hydrochloric acid, we'll see that the iron is going to react with chlorine to get iron 2 chloride. The hydrogen is going to react with sulfur to get gas E, which is hydrogen sulfide. So that is, uh, that's what's going to happen in, in this diagram. So apart from that, we have question letter C is asking, state the condition under which sulfur and water are formed. So the condition under which sulfur and water is formed according to this chart, we see that we have burn and then letter X. So we see that there is limited supply of oxygen gas. So since there is limited supply of oxygen, of oxygen gas, that's why you are going to get sulfur and water together. Because of the limited air or limited supply of oxygen gas in this experiment. So apart from that, let's go to question number five, which is also another flow chart. And then the question is asking, study the diagram below. Study the diagram below and answer the questions that follow. So as we can see, that is a chart whereby we begin with solid A and then we, uh, we add conch sulfuric acid. Then below we have water, we have gas, uh, and then the chart continues. So the first question is asking, name solid letter A. So as you can see in the diagram, we have the flow chart. Uh, yeah. So in the diagram, we have the flow chart. So we have yellow solid A. So automatically, a yellow solid, that is sulfur. That is just automatically sulfur. A yellow solid is sulfur. Remember, if we hit sulfur, we are going to get an amber liquid sulfur or an orange liquid sulfur. So the yellow solid A automatically is sulfur. So apart from that, Roman 2 is asking, name gas B. So remember, the solid A, so we have solid A if we add conch sulfuric acid. So remember, in the chemical properties of sulfur, we say that sulfur does not react with dilute acids, but sulfur reacts with oxidizing acids such as conch sulfuric acid and conch nitric acid. So it will mean that if sulfur reacts with conch sulfuric acid and nitric acid, we are bound to get sulfur for oxide gas and water being liberated. So in this case, we see that sulfur is reacting with conch sulfuric acid. So automatically, the first uh, answer we have been given that, the first answer is water. So what is gas E? So gas E automatically becomes sulfur for oxide. So that is sulfur for oxide. So apart from that, the next question is asking, write the formula of the anion in the white precipitate C that is formed. So write the formula of the anion in the white precipitate that is formed. So you see that that gas letter B is reacting with uh, is reacting with barium chloride. So that gas letter B is bubbled through barium chloride in order to get the white precipitate. So that's why this question is asking write uh, the formula of the anion formed in the white precipitate. So the anion formed in this white precipitate will be a sulfite, sulfite which is SO3 2 minus. So that is the anion. So the anion, remember, is a negatively charged ion. So a cation, remember, is a positively charged ion. 
Like for example, for the cations positively charged, we have any metal, potassium, we have calcium, we have sodium. So a positively charged ion is called a cation. A negatively charged ion is called an anion. So in this case, this question is asking, write the formula of the anion in the white precipitate. So the negatively charged ion. So the negatively charged ion in this precipitate will be a sulfite, which is SO3, 2, negative. And that is the, uh, the white precipitate or the anion of the white precipitate. So apart from that, the last question is asking, dilute nitric acid is added to the white precipitate labeled C that you have just, uh, that you have just uh, mentioned. So dilute nitric acid is added to the white precipitate C. Write an equation for, this, uh, for the reaction that takes place. So remember here, the white precipitate is a precipitate of barium sulfite. So of barium sulfite, which is BASO3. So the barium sulfite, you have been told that it reacts with dilute nitric acid. So if barium sulfate reacts with dilute nitric acid, therefore we are going to get barium nitrate plus sulfur 4 oxide plus water molecule. So this is the equation for the reaction. Barium sulfate reacting with uh, dilute nitric acid, we are going to get barium nitrate plus sulfur 4 oxide plus water molecules. So that is that in that question. So remember, the white precipitate is the barium sulfate. So that is the barium sulfide that's going to be formed. So this resulting solution is now going to be colorless in color. So the white precipitate is going to dissolve. So this solution is going to be colorless in color.